Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome today our in-person and virtual participants, including a number of ADST board members. And I'd like to announce that we're going to hold our business portion of our annual general meeting on uh, November 1st. At that meeting, we'll provide updates on our projects and particularly the effort on the Hill to secure a commemorative coin for the 100th anniversary of the Rogers Act and the Modern Foreign Service. And so many of you have been working so hard on this. I would very much like to thank you and uh, your efforts to generate congressional support. So as you know, ADST is an organization which focuses on the history of diplomacy and through our unique collection on the broader history of the United States. So we are particularly fortunate to have with us today noted historian Philip Zellico. He will join us as our annual distinguished speaker. I'd also like to recognize Mrs. Paige Zellico, and we're very uh, happy to have her with us today. Phil Zellico's career has been an overlapping series of leading roles in academia, in government, and in the law. Most people in this audience uh, probably think of him first as a counselor in the department under Secretary Condi Rice, and then as the executive director of the 9-11 Commission. The report of the commission was an example of sober and painstaking analysis wisely presented that put to bed many of the controversies surrounding the attack, unlike, I might say, other commissions that were convoked uh, to deal with national tragedies. Dr. Zellico served on the President's Intelligence Advisory Board under both Democrats and Republicans, and on the Defense Policy Board with the late Secretary of Defense. Just this morning, he testified before the House Foreign Affairs Committee about seizing Russian assets for Ukraine. Let me add that I was in the department when Phil Zellico was a counselor, and he was known for his intellectual integrity and his backbone of steel. The first part, the what to do part, is an easy debate to follow. It is mostly about goals. People discuss problems, which problems they care about, their values, the role of government. The news is naturally devoted to spotlighting problems and making claims for attention. The second part, the how to do it part, is a good deal harder to understand. The debates are far more obscure. People have to make judgments about practical action. That requires specialized knowledge about the available instruments and the relevant circumstances. So my argument though to you is between these two dimensions, the well-known what to do part, the little known how to do part, is that the how knowledge is the high card in the deck. Once it is played, high sounding goals often turn to dust. The former American Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, once put it this way, ideas are not policies. Besides, he added, ideas have a high infant mortality rate. Close quote. The how is the craft in statecraft. Usually the best diplomacy is a kind of choreography. Roles are assigned. Steps are planned. Each of the dancers hits their marks. Mastery of the how, as any sergeant can tell you in a, pl in a platoon, mastery of the how is the true source of practical leadership. Yet this dimension is not well understood. It is infrequently studied and it is rarely taught. So, let me turn now to a history story. That's a bit of a story about the how. I want to bring you back to the turning point of the First World War, what at the time they called the Great War. The turning point came in the second half of 1916 and the first weeks of 1917. The turning point did not occur on the battlefield. The turning point actually was long visible to all the relevant publics. In the second half of 1916 and first weeks of 1917, the great secret was that the war was on course to wind down and come to an end. 
In secret, leaders in Britain and France confided that they saw no plausible path to victory. Russia was tottering toward revolution. For those of you who don't remember these chronologies, the fall, the fall of the Tsar happens in March 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution in October or November 1917, depending on which calendar you use. Uh, Russia was already by late 1916 was clear that to people at the time that could not survive much longer unless something had changed. So as I detailed in my book, The Road Less Traveled, the British and French leaders expected that the way the war would end was that the American president, Woodrow Wilson, was going to call a peace conference to end the war. And they actually discussed these expectations with each other by the summer of 1916. That was a great secret. There was an even greater secret. Even those in, uh, who wanted to fight to the finish, fight to victory, and those factions were in every capital. Those factions knew if at the very top, because this was a super secret also on the Allied side, they knew the Allied side could not go on much longer, even if it wanted to. It was running out of the dollars to be able to purchase the food and munitions that sustained nearly half their war effort. The Americans cut off unsecured loans to the Allies, Allied side in November 1916. Um, sometimes I make this argument to people and they make the argument back that, well, the, the Americans couldn't possibly have ever cut off finance to the Allies. They, they would never have been able to do that. And then they don't realize that actually we did um, in November 1916. The money would run out, uh, the lead financiers knew, the money, the dollars to sustain the Allied war effort was going to run out by the spring of 1917. Meanwhile, not knowing that those all on the other side, the Germans and their allies had also decided that they had to end the war. The German leadership were the ones who made the first move. With the Kaiser's explicit approval, which he gave at a conference on the 27th of July, 1916. In August, 1916, Germany's chancellor, Theobald von bettmann holbeck let's just say Bettmann for short, Bettmann secretly reached out to President Wilson and urged him to proceed with the peace conference. The Austro-Hungarian leaders secretly approved of this move. And they approved of the large concessions the German chancellor secretly confided he was prepared to make. In fact, at the time, the chancellor went to the Kaiser to get permission. He says, you know, we'll have to agree to give up Belgium. And the Kaiser, oh, of course. Um, and actually, uh, Bettmann would later mention that to Wilson. Wilson never hadn't even raised the subject. Just to, as a way of kind of just so you understand my good faith. Um, so for Wilson, the what to do part was clear. Wilson was anxious to help. He wanted to end the awful war. He had, he had been looking for this role as the peacemaker since at least the end of 1914. He, as like everyone, was aware that the last war between the great powers had been ended by the mediation of an American president. That was the Russo-Japanese War, which was ended by the mediation of Theodore Roosevelt, for which Roosevelt then won the newly minted Nobel Peace Prize. So that was only 10 years earlier. Everyone remembered that. Wilson was ready and eager to move. The German ambassador to the United States, Johann von Bernstorff, rightly judged that at least from May 1916 until January 31st, 1917, Wilson was genuinely neutral and passionate about making peace. So the what to do part was there. Also, Wilson was realistic. He's often portrayed in the literature as this woolly headed idealistic fellow. In fact, uh, in, he regarded himself as a pragmatist. He actually used that word 
to describe his approach to things. Um, he was realistic. He was informed by American military attaches and others watching the war and was realistic about the prospects for either side to gain a decisive victory. He was realistic in not trying to decide who was at fault for the war and wasn't going to engage that. One reason he was so eager to make peace as soon as possible was because he judged, again realistically, that his failure to make peace meant America might be pulled into a war that both he and the country fervently did not want. Wilson was also quite realistic in his modesty about trying to reorganize Europe. At that time, in, in late 1916 and early 1917, he did not wish to even engage on questions of territorial peace terms and sought what he called, following the line of a lead editorial that Walter Lippmann wrote in the New Republic, a peace without victory. The signature line of the speech he gave in January 1917. And a reason he sought a peace without victory was to encourage a reasonably conservative settlement to avoid a series of annexations or humiliations that would only plant the seeds for future conflicts. So in this respect, his fundamental outlook on Europe's evolution was similar to that of similarly conservative statesmen seeking peace in both Britain and in Germany. Wilson was not only realistic, he was also deeply perceptive when he explained both in his December 1916 peace note, and then again in his January 1917 peace without victory speech, that a peace without victory, without victory, was the best and perhaps the only way to secure a peace that might endure. Wilson was realistic yet again when he accepted the British argument that the US had to take part in a post-war League of Nations to reassure the allies that a compromise peace could last. And knowing that that was a key th issue for the British Peace Party, the secret British Peace Party, he gave that speech making that pledge in May, 1916, breaking with 150 years of traditional American reluctance to make any engagement to be involved in guaranteeing peace in the world. So, it all failed. It all went wrong. You know that instead of the war ending, it actually uh, widened and deepened and became much, much worse. So having predicted correctly that a peace accompanied by bloody victories and humiliating defeats would not last, Wilson found himself toward the end of his life condemned like some figure in mythology, to suffer the prolonged and painful validation of his own dark prophecy. Because America ended up entering the war rather than ending it, the war fell off a precipice that led to unremitting conflict across the whole length of Eurasia and across the Middle East, leaving wounds that never healed. Thus, in 1919, Wilson found himself orating fruitlessly against the doom he had himself once prophesied. Then, after his physical breakdown in September 1919, Wilson had to watch the ruin continue until death took him early in 1924. So, back to September 1916, after the German Chancellor made that secret move to open it up. By September 1916, all the stars were in alignment for Wilson's peace move. Leaders on both sides were pessimistic secretly about their prospects in the war and worried about their ability to continue. The Germans had formally asked Wilson to act. They had secretly volunteered the restoration of Belgium to show their good faith readiness to reach a compromise peace. The British and French were reluctant to make a peace based only on the mid-war status quo the status quo of 1916, it was a measure of their desperation that a significant faction was willing to contemplate even that. Others open to peace needed a little more. They could have had more. 
Wilson could have brokered a peace conference conditioned on a plain German commitment to restore Belgium, which would have taken away the issue in Britain for the British public, and a commitment to withdraw from at least most of occupied France. Uh, the restoration of Belgium immediately implied all German would, would withdraw from northern France. Wilson could have gone further and attempted to arrange armistice lines while the talks were underway that accomplished much of those withdrawals in a civilized manner, perhaps accompanied by the relaxation of the sea blockades being imposed on both sides. Just the Belgian condition alone would have utterly transformed the politics surrounding peace, in Britain at least. In 1916-17, therefore, why did Wilson fail to make peace when all the circumstances were right? He did not fail because he was encumbered by ideals. He failed because he simply did not know how to do it. He was the man who sits down at the poker game and dealt a hand with three kings, throws back two of them in the hope of getting better cards. For two months, between September and November 1916, Wilson did nothing because of the happenstance that 1916 was a presidential election year, and he felt he could not move until he was reelected. Then, for another month, a vital month, from mid-November to mid-December, Wilson did nothing, even though he felt an extreme urgency to act. As his first priority the first day back in the office after the election. Because his government had made no plans whatsoever and offered no advice at all, not one page, for what Wilson should do. Literally not even one written paragraph. And then Wilson was effectively delayed and deflected by his two relevant subordinates. Um, Edward House and Robert Hensing. Therefore, improvising entirely on his own, with no staff help at all, Wilson therefore still set the stage in November 1916 with powerful added pressure on the British, preparing them to make the move, to bring make his move. Wilson, it turns out, quite secretly was the one who orchestrated the cutoff of unsecured loans to the Allies and did so in secret written and oral communications with the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, an Alabaman named William Proctor Hart. It was Wilson who then dictated a harsh secret letter to the British, telling them that they needed to now make peace and needed to make the move that actually he'd been working on with them back in the spring. But Wilson then issued, having after the delays that House and Lansing imposed on him, he issued an ineffectual peace note late in December that was a complete misfire. He had originally written a note, actually, that called for the peace conference and made all the right arguments. House made the argument to him, says, oh, the, Brit the allies will resent this so deeply. You just have to do something to prepare the way to them and soften their attitudes towards you before you go in. Just take out that call for a peace conference. Well, then what's the action item in the speak in, in the in the note? You have taken out any call for a peace conference. And, uh, House had no ideas, and actually because he's trying to secretly block the whole thing altogether and was conspiring with Lansing to do that seek privately. Um, so then Wilson looked around, saw a newspaper op-ed that had been written under a pseudonym in the New York Times. It was actually written by the president of Columbia, Nicholas Murray Butler. Wilson hated Butler, but he didn't know Butler had written it. It was written, published under a pseudonym. That This op-ed had the wonderful idea, which all the diplomats hear. That, Why not give a note in which you ask both sides to publicly announce their peace terms? Go pub we, we invite each side to publicly announce their bottom lines. Right, it's all of you kind of like, well, <laughs> and of course, your reaction 
was exactly the reaction that happened in all the warring capitals when Wilson issued that note following that op-ed's advice because he'd gotten no advice from his people. He just borrowed this advice he read in the New York Times. And of course, the capitals, they just, you know, in fact, everyone in both capitals, Berlin, London, Paris, just look at each other in bewilderment. Like, well, what do we even say to this? <laughs> It's interesting that the British decided to ignore it for a while and then just some conjure up some rhetorical nonsense to just kind of at least answer the mail. The Germans just shook their heads and wondered if this was all an allied conspiracy. Um, so the note took no practical action. That was mid-December. The note having been delayed by his advisors for at least three weeks. Then what followed was about six weeks of confused efforts to get a better peace move going, as Wilson and me kind of immediately realized that that had been a bust. Still not getting any constructive advice from his own people, it turned out that Bernstorff and the head of British intelligence in Washington <laughs> were actually kind of, well, you might try this. <laughs> Here's one way you could do this. Bernstorff, a very capable professional diplomat, and the the British intelligence officer, a young army captain named William Wiseman, who was representing the British Secret Service in America, actually both attempted to guide House and kind of, here's how you do this. And they finally, between Berenstorff and House, work out a way to do this in which the Germans will agree to certain preconditions. And then Wilson will then call for the peace conference. And Berenstorff writes back to Bettman. Bettman sends back, yes, I agree. Tell them yes. <laughs> And Bernstorff then goes in and finds that actually now Wilson has a whole new plan. He drew this plan, uh, again, getting no advice internally, having read essays, leaders in the New Republic that were published at the end of December 1916, at the beginning of January 1917, that he needs to make a speech announcing the conditions the allies should meet if they want if they want the conditions both sides should meet if they want America to help them with peace. He should make a speech not like that. Um, meanwhile, Bernstorff gets his green light from Berlin, follows through on the peace plan he thought he'd negotiated with House. Wilson and House then are, oh, yeah, oh, hmm, the Germans are kind of agreeing to all of this. They're startled, encouraged. They get further in kind of advice on what to do, again, not from Americans, but from British parliamentarians. And Herbert Hoover, then the American humanitarian envoy, helping rebuild things, drops by what kind of New York and Washington. Oh, is that what you're trying to do? And then, pop, 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 pop. <laughs> you know, it's like, does it gives them the sensible advice anyone here would have given. You, know, you get some pre you know. And then they say, oh, then Wilson starts resetting the plan to conform with this. Finally, by the last week of January, 1917, Wilson at last starts to construct the plan to set up peace talks that had actually been available to him for at least the last five months. On January 31st, 1917, the German government delivers two notes to him. One is the note going ahead with expanding the U-boat war because in Berlin, they had, uh, the Kaiser had given up on Wilson. It's like, we're going to try the Wilson peace move. One reason he gave up on Wilson was because House lied to Bernstorff and said, the reason you, the Americans are delaying and shilly-shallying so long on this, I, House, I, I so, I'm so supportive of your peace move. It's Wilson. He just, he's vacillating. He's afraid of what the allies will say. This is a complete lie. We know it is a complete lie from House's own diaries. House had exactly reversed the positions. It was House who was trying to undermine the peace move and Wilson who urgently wanted to move forward. But House told the Germans, faithfully, that it was just the other way around. And of course, that goes to the Kaiser. So meanwhile, even on that last day where they give you them the, Germ the Germans give Wilson that, that we you know, we're going to resume on submarine warfare, which is their last desperate military panacea if the peace move failed. The same day, Bettman desperately writes a note directly, a letter directly to Wilson that's also delivered at the same time that says, look, did you want to know more about my peace terms? 
here, here's a letter. Please keep this secret. And it's just, you know, and it, and it kind of puts enough in it that a diplomat would recognize that, you know, there's soft restoration of Belgium, blah, 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 and, and a lot of soft language that makes it clear that they're interested in compromise. Um, and if you'll get the peace conference going, we'll stop the submarine warfare. Um, meanwhile, Wilson gets the note about submarine warfare. He's stunned. He thinks that I'm about to, he, I'm on the road here to calling the peace conference that would end the war, which might possibly be only weeks away. And here the Germans give me this note start, and start that's a public note, resuming submarine warfare. Shocked and reeling, he then angrily brushed past the German chancellor's effort to keep the peace option alive and just blew that letter off. Wilson still sincerely did not want to bring America into the war. He actually then spent more than another month debating internally and agonizing over whether to do it. But they had just sent the German ambassador home in broken relations. And having sent the German ambassador home, Wilson eventually found that war was the only option he had left. It was the only remaining card. So... This is a story of uh, the difference between knowing what you want to do and knowing how to do it. I think this is um, possibly this, uh, the, the single most tragic episode in the entire diplomatic history of the United States. The consequences of the failure to end the war, because the war was on path to end one way or another. Only American entry could have sustained the war, because only American finance then kept the war effort going. The loans did, the, the credit supply did run out as forecasted, and the American government itself then had to just lend the money out of the treasury on a gigantic scale to keep the war effort alive. Um, and then, of course, we sent two million soldiers to France. And, of course, world history changed. Russia then not only had the fall of the Tsar, but then in the fall, Russia still in the war, you get the Bolshevik Revolution with all of those consequences. So the how to do it part is important. Understanding how to do diplomacy is important. It's an illustration. I want to now just kind of carry the story a little bit, just jump forward to the present day. I think at the present, I think I speak to you now at I think uh, an important moment in American and world history. I believe as a historian that we have now entered a period of high crisis the most intense period of high crisis, um, at least since 1962. Um, I think this uh, this is a prolonged period that began at least a year and a half ago and will continue for some time. And I don't know how it turns out. In this period of very high crisis, this period of world history, the demand for American foreign policy is as high as it's ever been in our generation. The world is demanding that we have a foreign policy on many things. And I'll tell you, the demand for American foreign policy far exceeds the supply. Now, I define the term policy in two senses. There's policy in one sense, which is figurative, performative. This is, I have a policy because I have a position. I have a posture. I have a pose. I strike a pose, a pose of friendliness, toughness, but it's a pose. It's a paper policy. I can't meet the demand to actually do something. So I, instead of actually giving you real coinage, I will print some paper. There is a second sense of policy, the sense I want to dwell on. The demand for America actually to do something in the world that has real, that has effects in the world where you, things happen. That's what the real demand is for. And in a period of high crisis, in a period of emergencies, operations matter. The doing of things is what matters in emergencies. 
not the pose, not the statement of willingness to help, not the statement that you care. It's interesting to contemplate why the supply of that kind of foreign policy is so constrained right now. Part of this is the relatively narrow base of, um, for American foreign policy actually in the United States itself. This is historically true over a very long time. In a way, the post-war period of intense interest is anomalous set against the entire course of American history. American, the majority of Americans do not own a passport. Um, the, most Americans are not interested and do not attend to foreign affairs. And if they attend to them, it's probably somewhere below the attention they give to their local sports team. The, um, the, uh, so that you have a relatively narrow base of political interest and attention. And then the, you have a relatively narrow base of the capability to do things. And a lot of that capability is now devoted to intelligence work, which is all about identifying problems, but devotes no time on how to solve them. And then a lot of it is devoted, of course, to the military instruments. So what we have then is in recent years is a sad record of many failures of policy supply. And we, all of you know those, uh, those stories and there's no need for me to mention it or repeat them. Ron Newman has actually written uh, and analyzed some of these uh, quite elegantly and uh, has articulated some of this quite well. When I, at lunch today, I was talking a little bit about my house testimony on Russian assets in Ukraine and uh, um, I talked about we need to move this money. And there was this extraordinary moment, which Anne and, and Rob and others at the lunch will remember, that instantly, without my saying anything about what I was going to talk about today, Anne Patterson on my left said, well, yeah, how would you do it? And Rob and Rafel made a comment, essentially the same comment. And that was like their instant instinctive reaction. Well, how would you do it? Well, how would you actually move the money? How would you actually deploy and distribute the money? And I want you to just notice that like automatic instinct from those two uh, veteran diplomats and field workers, because that's actually really revealing that instinctive feel for the supply of real policy, and then the understanding of the shortage of it. The tendency to react to events rather than drive them, poorly specified objectives, confusing guidance, reliance on weekly evidence to suppositions, little grasp of organizational capacities, inability to adapt organizations to new problems, over-reliance on ill-managed contractors. These are all symptoms. They are symptoms of policies that are badly designed. Weak knowledge of the history of certain issues or even of the government's own policy record a superficial grasp of other communities or institutions, and a preoccupation with reactions to daily news. These too are symptoms. They are symptoms of a weakening capacity for in-depth professional assessment. That's geared to practical action. Of course, the marked tendency to militarize policy, to rely on military instruments and military policymakers, which was repeated again in the COVID wars Operation Warp Speed, is no cure, it is another symptom of the breakdown as American policymaking is dumbed down and becomes praetorian. Some of these problems can be claimed on bad structures and on polarized dysfunctional politics, but that's not all of the story. I think a big part of the story is the broad inattention to that second dimension, the how to do it part, to the craft in statecraft. As the immensely powerful Qing Empire in China began to decay in the early 1800s, a leading scholar began calling for reform of the Confucian system that selected and trained the country's administrative elite. He looked around and saw, quote, everything was falling apart. The administration was contaminated and vile. The scholar, Bao Xi Chen, quote, found himself drawn toward more practical kinds of scholarship that were not tested on the civil service exams, close quote. Bao Xi Chen, quote, would in time, according to the scholar writing about this, 
would in time become one of the leading figures in a field known broadly as statecraft scholarship, an informal movement of Confucians who were deeply concerned with real world issues of administration and policy, close quote. Tragically for Bao and many of his allies, their efforts were not enough. They could not reverse the decline of their empire. The United States government has plenty of problems too. Fortunately, it is not yet at the point the Qing dynasty reached. Americans' seemingly bygone skills for policymaking and tackling emergencies were not in their genes or in the air. They need not be consigned to wistful nostalgia. The skills were specific. They were fostered by the surrounding culture, and they can be relearned. Knowledge relates ends and means. Know-how relates ends and means. Know-how guides and inspires confident performance. The study of statecraft would profit by spending less time on the should and more time on the how. So, questions? Yes. Going to be available to every college president, <laughs> everybody at the State Department, and every incoming administration, who, yeah, I, who I, none of whom think history, know how, and only want to do policy. Yes, because they all want to have pose, strike poses. Yeah, um, and have titles. Um, yes, in fact, uh, given the enormous success of the COVID vaccine mandate, I've been thinking about turning this into a, a biological inoculation um, <laughs> that we, you know, we can kind of require um, as uh, for entry into into many professions. Um, well, I'll do the best I can. I'll put it that way, and then all of you can do the best you can. Actually, I think, in a way, what uh, I hope what you're sensing is I'm simply articulating something you already knew. And maybe I'm articulating it in a little different way. And I'm, I'm sure all of you in your own ways, because you already know this, already find, trying to find your own ways of articulating it to the people who you think can influence things one way or another. So we'll all, among us, we'll keep experimenting in how we can articulate this point. But I, I do think that as we notice the period of history that we're in, that the moment to press this point has reached a kind of apex. I think this is, I mean, I'll give you an illustration uh, and uh, the number of people here will immediately click to this. Uh, right now in the State Department, I don't know this, I just, but I know it. Right now people uh, are working on what are we gonna do about Gaza when this is over? Um, some of us who've worked on Gaza in the past um, I was involved in negotiating the 2005 withdrawals with Palestinians and Israelis, and I was involved in the negotiations to put UNIFIL in Lebanon again in 06 after that war. So right now there are people who are working, is, the Israelis do not want to and cannot unilaterally solve the future of Gaza. There is no scenario in which they can unilaterally do that. So some groupage of foreigners are going to have to get very deeply involved in whatever that answer is. And there are people right now, I believe, and our old friend Satterfield has been, you know, probably reluctantly lassoed from, he thought he'd run off to Houston and now he's been corralled back into service. Uh, but he and others are working this right now. I think are already doing work on trying to imagine this trying to figure out how to write talking points for Tony Blinken to at least just kind of get through the meeting and, and put down some markers for the possible future. So when you think about that, and if you worked, if you thought about that problem, so let's say for half an hour, that's a heavy lift. But what you would think about, your instinct would be the Robin and Anne instinct 
Okay, there's just a ton of stuff you need to work. Exactly. I, I use this illustration that right now, the deficit between demand and supply of American ability to do stuff in foreign policy is having another super acute moment aggravated by this crisis at this instant. Ron. Thank you. Thank you for the mention of you. It's been quite unexpected. But um, it, I, I've, as you said, pondered this problem too, not perhaps quite as eloquently as you have. But I pondered, you know, where does this come from? And one theory I've had, but it's kind of a prejudice rather than a fact-based theory, uh, is that this is partly rely, resides in how we teach uh, foreign policy and foreign affairs, which with the exception of certain AFSCME schools, uh, schools and practitioners and people like you, the Benian, is heavily theoretical. It's heavily focused on the, on the what, uh, the, the average foreign policy article that spends 90% of its time in analyzing the problem, as George Casey used to say, and then has a brief statement of a what with no notion of how. But this is the way we teach people, which means that if you don't have an apprenticeship in the doing, you arrive in high government position, actually with very little understanding of what you've talked about. And so I had two questions. One is, am I unfair in that, you know, kind of blaming my academic colleagues? And two, do you see any change in academia? Do you see the kind of, you know, you're you're out there, you're teaching, you're associating. Do you, do you see any growing awareness in scholarship, not just in the sort of op-ed, of the need to focus on the how? Well, actually, um, I'm trying in my way, and there are a few others trying in little ways to uh, trigger that. And you're not being unfair at all. Actually, uh, to... No, the situation's very bad. Um, it's not bad because they're stupid. They're actually, of course, they're they're like many of them are just super smart, and they're very interested in. What you have to understand is that from the point of view of social scientists and people who teach in international relations, who are overwhelmingly from the discipline of political science, um, they, their whole uh, academic life is actually asking questions that are relevant to that discipline. The questions I'm talking about aren't relevant in their discipline. So, you know, the, the beginning of wisdom is to understand that to a political, uh, pol political scientist view policymakers in the same way that entomologists view ants. Um, they, they study the behavior of these creatures and they try to discern patterns of behavior in order to develop scientific generalizations about these patterns of behavior that these creatures evidence. Um, th there are actually a number of very serious philosophical problems in, their, in, in their, that discipline, actually. It turns out that it's very difficult to develop uh, scientifically meaningful, scientifically valid generalizations about these kinds of aggregate behaviors. I, but I won't go down that too far. I'll just simply say, though, that by their lights, of course, what they're doing is very natural. If you think about what our international relations courses consist of, they're, they're basically depictions of the behavior of the insects and the, and the observable patterns. And then the broad... So it's not so much that they don't care, it's just that they, they, they channel that caring into a discipline that has framed everything they do in this context. So they're answering questions that are meaningful in their world and in the world of their promotions and publications. Now, um, they're just simply not being taught by profession, by people who actually do these things in practice, unless they, now occasionally they'll run into the rare class where some X person and, uh, will regale them with war stories. And every so often they'll do a little better than just the war stories and they'll offer, and there are night classes taught by veterans here in Washington as people get their master's degrees that'll give them a slight raise in their salaries and so on. The, um, but the fundamental, now historians do offer a partial corrective to this because um, good histories at least have the virtue of being lifelike. And 
relatively and relatively lifelike vicarious experiences of policymaking is education. And I, that's why I tend as a scholar to spend most of my time in history, although someone mentioned they had encountered my, and mentioned encountering my, my political science text, but uh, which, about which I have mixed feelings. Um, but it, anyway, it, it, it's serviceable. Um, it's mostly serviceable because it, it tries to offer a taxonomy of explanations. It doesn't really offer a set of scientific generalizations that are predictive. Um, and it's a use, it's a somewhat useful taxon. It's a very awkward way of actually telling the story. The, uh, um, the one of the problems we have in the history discipline is that actually interest in really lifelike understanding of the how to do part is, it was, it, it, it's, it's harder and harder to really find good books of this kind. It's uh, mostly they're not interested in those subjects. Those subjects are substantially out of fashion what the books they do publish, actually from the point of view of people who are involved in the craft, they often really don't shed much light on the real craft involved, on like why did people make the choices they made? So they're just kind of, it's just like a cumulative collection of anecdotes. And so if for some like you, Ron, some, a lot of books that even purport to be diplomatic histories might read to you like pretty thin rule. Um, so there's, there's that issue too. But uh, and again, but in a way, this is what happens in academia in a time of drift and complacency in the culture about America and the world. We're, that period is, is now at an end for a while. There is going to be a reaction in the culture and in academia to this. My hope is oftentimes in American history, these reactions then are punctuated by severe traumas. And my hope is that we don't... Uh, that we don't have to need that severe trauma to get that reaction this time. And because what happened when, when, if you think back to when we were really good at this stuff, of course it, it grew out of the traumas of the thirties and then especially the forties. And then there was a whole generation of people who had basically been trained by the forties. And then that generation trained about the next generation after them. And after that, the training kind of attenuated and slowly dissipated because it was almost entirely oral training. It didn't come out of the academy and it didn't go back into the academy. And the, uh, it mostly was being passed along by oral learning and apprenticeships, if you were lucky, lucky enough to work for good people. And, you know, kind of like certain medieval arts of making stained glass and things like that, that uh, the skills get attenuated and sometimes lost. But um, we're gonna, one way or another, life is gonna be forcing us to rediscover a lot of these skills and promote them. So I think this is an important period now and a way to use this period to reemphasize the kind of ideas all of us, you, Ron, have, have been helping to, to foot stomp now for some time is we need to get folks involved again in operational, uh, in the operational real world of foreign policy. Um, I will say that um, we could triple the size of the foreign service um, next year, triple it, and the budgetary impact would be modest. And we would be beginning to make, a, we would start making a satisfactory dent in the foreign policy supply problem. We would need to, we can't just pour old wine, new wine into that old vessel though. We would need to reconceive what the Foreign Service is. We would need to reconceive the, our whole approach to training, the whole, whole approach to the way we use contractors, and our whole approach to the relationship between the State Department and the analytical side of the intelligence community. As to kind of to reallocate the responsibility as whose job is it to interpret foreigners. That, that's just my little agenda. As I bring the microphone forward, let me just remind our online audience that if you have questions, please put them in the chat. How about that gentleman right there? Thank you very much, Jim Dandajir. And that was such a provocative presentation and I will do my best to not spend 15 minutes asking a, a question for a two minute answer. But I, I was wondering, uh, in your assessment, what did Wilson really do wrong? It seems as though, you know, first of all, he had a four-year war and it took him five years to get a treaty on it. He was really 
pushing for a, a global um, sphere, as you've already touched on, the League of Nations, which came out in 19. But at the same time, he seemed to have prepared the executive branch, but something happened on the legislative side of the house. He couldn't get his 14 points through, for, as an example. Where did he go wrong with all of these great um, futuristic ideas that we're living now? Well, actually, my book doesn't comment at all on the failures of peacemaking in 1918 and 1919. Uh, I just don't get it. That's There are other good books on that. Probably, if you're interested, the best is by John Milton Cooper called Breaking the Heart of the World. Um, I focus actually on an episode that mostly that hadn't been noticed because I actually stumbled upon it in the course of other historical research and realized that it had been mostly missed. Um, and you can't really put it together unless you work both in the American archives and in the British and in the German records all at the same time and push them together. And actually, some of the major disclosures actually come out of the British records, which have been the most recent, the ones that have not been available until most recent, but then unlock a lot of other keys. So I just focus on the 1916-1917 turning point, because if America doesn't go into the war, the war ends. And then it ends on either on something that would have been fairly close to a status quo anti-peace. So all Wilson had really had to do was to call a peace conference that made it that unif that brought together the people who were interested in a compromised peace. And the political argument they would make to their countries is every one of the publics thought they were fighting for self-defense. That was the story all of them had been told and believed. There were uh, annexationist factions seeking conquest in all the capitals, but the majority of the publics weren't interested in any of that. They all thought they were fighting for self-defense. And they would all have their self-defense narrative. France would have, the Germans would have left France. The Germans would have left Belgium. Uh, France, the France defended herself. And the Germans would have, would have had their self-defense narrative. They had a whole narrative. Bettmann politically prepared the factions in parliament for the compromise peace with just this narrative is we were encircled by all these enemies. We will have successfully defended the existence of Germany. He said, you know, if, if we can preserve the achievements of 1870, we should fall to our knees and thank God. Um, that's, you know, that's a narrative. So they all had that narrative. Well, but they needed, but none of them could stand up and ask for peace because it's politically impossible to display weakness. Um, they all were looking to Wilson to play that role, and Wilson was eager to play it. So why he failed is he just he just blew the play. Um, he offered these feckless peace notes and then screwed up the moves and behaved in ways that I think when I commend my book to the people who the people who will enjoy my book the most are people who are diplomats. Because they will like, they'll read it, they will like instantly get exactly what I'm talking about. It's like, oh, well, because you will read it, and say, it's obvious to you what they should now be doing. <laughs> you, know, you know, kind of that Ann Patterson, Robin Rayfold instinctive, you know, you'll see immediately what they should have been doing, and you'll see immediately what's going wrong. But I'm only concentrating on that, on that one period where America enters the war instead of ending it. John? Not good, as always, uh, uh. Philip. So, but I want to uh, I want to get a more parochial question about the how. So we do something very specific here. Uh, people already know what I'm going to ask. I think before I ask it, which is, uh, so you've actually to a certain extent admired the problem and a, a, a bit as well, and only because we didn't give you an hour and a half to give us the solution. So you know we provide a little bit of a solution, which is we collect these fantastic oral histories. Fortunately, uh, you are somebody who also presided over one of the great oral history uh, houses for many years, and you've made use of them. The question is, to solve the problem that you have identified, how do we make use of our oral histories so that it's not sort of too long a a uh, train. I mean, I can see what you know, the oral oral histories end up being used by wonderful historians like you, and then 
young people or older people read these books and then hopefully at some point they see, oh, this is how this great diplomat did it. But that's a very long process. So it, it, do you have some advice for us about how we make use of these really terrific oral histories that we've got so that people learn how to solve the problems and do the statecraft? Yeah, so uh, maybe for a couple of listeners who aren't aware that the Association for Diplomatic Studies Training, ADST, um, is the premier producer of people who collect oral histories of veteran diplomats. And so if you're interested in, uh, and it's it's a remarkable um, service, remarkable record. So, but as for advice, it's basically what you're in the business of doing is you're producing a supply of extraordinary evidence on a shoestring budget without, without, without any visible market demand in the hope that if you pr provide a decent supply, the people will realize it's there and the demand will come around. Um, so in a way, it's, uh, it's partly uh, you have to work the demand problem, but then that'll create more resources for the supply. And I think to work the demand problem is not mainly ADST's job. Um, it shouldn't be in a, in a, in a properly working world. Uh, I actually think leaders of the government and others who are leading scholars, I think there are things that people can do in the scholarly community and in the government that would really spotlight this. And that would basically say, you can't get, you can't get training or take jobs working on these things unless you study certain kinds of stuff. And, and but then that would create a demand that and then there'd be, you know, for instance, at lunch, we just suppose every ingo incoming ambassador had was asked or given a collection of oral histories from people who had served at that post in the last 20 years. Which would, by the way, be an extraordinary institutional history of, of these posts. And if I were an incoming ambassador, I like thank you, like that's great. Um, but of course, if, and if you told them to do that, and then they were it was so interesting, and then then they, they, they'd start quoting it back at some of the FSOs, who would then feel embarrassed that they had not read it. <laughs> right? You, uh, I'm I'm trying to you know we the 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 attention the State Department gives to its uh, institutional history and its training is pathetic. Yeah. <laughs> Let the record reflect that a chorus of approving <laughs> voices rang out from the from the multitude. Um, so, I, I think that obviously several of us here have a hobby horse about this, and I think, um, but I think the deeper root of this is, in a way, is a lot. Of, and someone alluded to this: is a lot of people get into this business seeing this foreign policy in, as a these series of abstractions. And therefore, they don't really appreciate the value of ground knowledge. Very few of them have actually served in the field in their apprenticeships. And so they don't, in a way, they don't know what they don't know and they don't understand what they can learn. And But if you create the demand and the supply can respond and money will flow. And I, so I think actually my answer to your question, Sean, is a little more is to work the demand side of the problem rather than focus a, a spotlight of criticism on ADST, which I think has done a heroic job on slender resources. Yeah. Do you think the whole FSI, I, I know there's a lot of uh, controversy on the Hill and discussion about improving the training capacity. Do you think, how do you think this, this because it's gotten worse, this inability to actually do things has gotten worse uh, and for reasons that aren't entirely clear to me, how does our training program need to be revised to, to reflect that? And going back to the book, Talk a minute about the relationship between Wilson and House, because obviously Wilson didn't know how to do lots of stuff, but he was also betrayed, Was is that too strong a word, by his closest advisor. It comes all down to personal relationships and people, like you said in the first book. Would you talk about that for a while, too? Yeah, so um, 
Let me take the easy part of your question first, which is how to reinvent foreign service training. Um, no, but, uh, um, you, uh, yeah, I, I really think you need to do professional training. I just think you need to reconceive the way we train people for foreign work. By the way, my view of foreign service work is not parochial to the quote foreign service. Um, for instance, I just did a, I spent a lot of time over the last two years working on the COVID crisis, leading something called the COVID crisis group, which published a report earlier this year. You may not know this, but the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, has a foreign service. And some of you have encountered at embassies. EPA has a foreign service. I mean, I could go, right? So the ambassadors here all know this. So, um, and our, you know, then you look at what's their training. By the way, CDC internally has just issued a report saying our training for our foreign people is terrible. We need to do a lot more with that. Right? And they, you know, 12 agencies can do that, right? And it's all a cacophony. And you begin to see we need a we need an approach to professional training here for foreign work that's just reconceived. FSI is just the FSI problems are fundamental. I mean, what FSI does, the basic concept that they have professional training is we'll orient you to administrative procedures and teach you a lot of the rules. It's basically, it's we're going to teach you how to work the process so that you, you know, know how to get reimbursed and what, you know, what we'll pay for and what we won't pay for and how not to get arrested and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, how to read the FAR, uh, the FAM, the FAM. Uh, the, the far as the DOD mess. So that's, you know, that's not professional training. I went to law schools. A lot of people here got professional training. It's not professional training. I mean, which is clinical training, right? So then, you, then there are different kinds of professional, there's generic professional training for certain kinds of skills. Then there's uh, subject matter specialized professional training, which we can come up with. Then you try to learn from things that actually worked. And you, we are so far, it's not like this is not an incremental change. I really think you need to reconceive the mission and then reconceive the breadth of that mission and enlist other agencies of the government in, um, in, in sharing in that and reconceiving the notion of what a foreign service is in pretty profound ways. The Foreign Service is about to celebrate its 100th anniversary. I think a great way to celebrate the centennial would be to uh, re reconceive and reinvent it. It's interesting, uh, I'll note this, uh, you may not know this. Uh, in that other last period of high crisis um, in the Kennedy administration, there was actually a small group that was tasked with reconceiving the Foreign Service. It was actually something that Kennedy himself cared personally about. And then he enlisted a really quite small group, four or five people to work on a report. It was a very short report. It's just like 10 pages long. And there was going to be legislation. Kennedy was personally interested in it. There were recorded meetings of him stepping on this. It was partly because Kennedy thought he was really the Secretary of State and Dean Rusk was the Deputy Secretary. Um, seriously, that's not really that far from the truth. So, but I mean, Kennedy took a deep interest in the State Department. He took a deep interest in it all the way down to who was manning the offices on the sixth floor and had direct personal relationships with lots of different people at State. And so that ends up, that actually became a bill that create uh, basically a whole new approach to the Foreign Service and a commission to work this up in early 1963. And the bill died in that Congress and was never revived. And I think uh, actually maybe uh, on the centennial, the, the time to revisit that has returned. This is not actually a, a wild idle comment. Um, turns out that um, the replacement of Menendez with Cardin as chairman of the SFRC is significant in this context. Cardin is interested in these issues. And there actually may be uh, some play in this space in uh, coming months. And a, if that happens, a lot of people in this room and ADST and the American Academy of Diplomacy will have a role to play. So this, this, doesn't, this is not then just a session of idle commiseration. Now, as to Wilson and House, it's a fraught relationship, a relationship that actually got the, the leading psychiatrist in the world, Sigmund Freud, 
to write a book about it, along with a highly disgruntled and embittered American diplomat named Bill Bullitt. And uh, 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 that was a psychobiography of Wilson and House. Um, so people have studied and wondered about this for a long time. House was an entire amateur, by the way. House never took, was never on the government payroll. He lived in New York in an apartment in New York and would come down when Wilson needed him. He was never, unlike Harry Hopkins, he never held a government job. He was a private advisor to the president and a private envoy to the president until the president grew disillusioned with him and cut his relationship with him. Not another word spoken between them beginning in the spring of 1919. But, um, it's, it's a, uh, I, you heard, what you heard me discuss in my talk was a picture of Wilson that is, Wilson is a much more interesting and uh, admirable person than a lot of the cartoons make out. But he's also uh, um, a deeply flawed person. And this relationship, the kind of the, the aloof self-reliance the unwillingness to basically recruit and rely on a team um, is a fundamental flaw and a key reason for his failure in the story. Um, it's true that at that time, our government and foreign affairs was kind of like a, the 19th century chancery of a, of a small European potentate. Um, you know, uh, one English historian looked at the Wilson White House and said it was like, Writing the reading the records of a parish church in the English countryside, um, with the with the vicar typing on his typewriter. Um, so there's that. But actually, Theodore Roosevelt, McKinley had actually created teams that helped them with some of their big accomplishments. No one, actually, in Wilson's administration, they knew that Roosevelt had done this thing. No one ever did the work. Well, how did Roosevelt do that? No one ever wrote a paper on that. Uh, there was a lot that actually they could have easily known at the time as to exactly how Roosevelt had done. Roosevelt did not himself take part in the negotiations. He just convened and arranged it and informally influenced it from the outside. It's just a very interesting story. It was successful. And actually, a very, the same kind of model would have, would have worked in this case. But the relationship with House is, uh, is an example of... Um, Wilson's flaws as a leader and the way he set himself up. In the, I get into the book and some of the analysis of House's character and his strengths and weaknesses and why House was being so difficult at this time, which has a little bit to do with one of the other great villains of my story, a man named David Lloyd George. <laughs> Professor, can I uh, wrap this up with a couple of questions from online? Um, from Michael McKinley, we have, thank you for your stimulating presentation. East, China, and other crises are not defined either by policy experts or political leaders. The inflection point on deciding how seems to be passing us by. Moreover, bureaucracies have no real way of pushing the envelope. If they had, there were plenty within the system who saw policies after 9-11 on Afghanistan and Iraq as damaging, but failed to change or influence policy direction. So it appears to come down to worldviews of our leaders and our society, rather than training or reorganization. Neither seem capable of seeing the world as it is where US influence is much diminished. How do we address this worldview constraint? And I'll just read the second one for you as well. Sylvia Johnson says, excellent discussion. Uh, regarding Wilson and his situation in 1916, did Lansing versus Vice Bryan significantly contribute to Wilson's inability to act constructively? And if there had been a peace without victory at, at that point, would history have changed in Russia? Um, the second question, is, yes, history would have changed in Russia. The Bolshevik Revolution happens because Russia stays in the war and the war continues. If the war doesn't continue, there is no Bolshevik Revolution. I think every historian of the revolution would agree with that statement. So for sure, no revolution. Um, the Tsar might have fallen, but the Bolsheviks would not have taken over. Um, the uh, As for the... Uh, and. And yes, um, in some ways, I think Brian would have served Wilson much better than Lansing. Uh, Brian had his flaws, but he uh, 
Lansing had much graver flaws in my view. Wilson regarded Lansing as a nothing better than a clerk. I think actually that was a more or less accurate estimation. Um, so <laughs> um, why then Wilson kept him as the Secretary of State and goes back to Anne's question. Um, I wanna come to Mike McKinley's uh, really deep question, which I think echoes uh, frustrations a lot of veterans of the last 20 years might feel. And part of it is, you see, I'm drawing a picture of the image and the reality of American foreign policy. And I think a lot of people function in the world of the imagery of American foreign policy. By the way, including the people who like us and the people who don't like us both function in that imaginary in which you know, they wield things um, in these abstractions. And, and it's greatly exaggerated. If you then really think about policy in this other sense of what is it concretely that we can do and are planning to do, um, and then uh, line up your strategies in line with that, then I think actually the, the analysis really just starts changing in a lot of ways. I can actually work through scenarios and all the crises you mentioned, not that predict what will happen, and, but I can work out here are potentials and then here are things that we could do to make a difference and then you can run your strategies on them or capabilities we might need to build and then the investments you need to make and start building them. When I talk about the difference between image and reality, that's not really, I'm not really taking a side in the war about, oh, America should just retreat because I'm a quote realist. I, I that's I don't, I'm not interested in those. Those are more abstract by cartoon binaries. Is mm -hmm. you can be just because you have a concrete view of what it is we can and can't do, or prepare to do things that we currently can't do doesn't mean that therefore a priori, I have a view on what we should do in Pakistan or what we should do in Gaza or what we should do in Ukraine. But it does mean that for sure, I know of no camp that says, yes, it's a good idea to adopt policies that catastrophically fail, right? I, I, there's no one who's like, I'm in favor of failure. No, so therefore, if, if you if you'll really be, if you'll really get more into what it is that we can do and then adjust our strategies, what is it that makes it in their world, in the foreigner's world, what is it that we do really makes a difference in their world? And then run a policy that's kind of founded on that insight, kind of in a way, so almost starting from the foreigner's world and then working back. Um, I think you can design policies with that context that can make some big differences. And then you, you'll realize right away that um, um, the United States has never been a unipolar power, ever. Um, in the height of the supposed unipolarity, and Condi Rice and I agree on this and wrote this, is that even at the beginning of the 1990s, it was a unipolar mirage. And as it, like with every mirage, when you get close to it, you know how it disappears. Um, because anyone who actually went into the field to do something in those years, actually do something, whether in the Balkans and Russia, you name the place. Like, what? Well, so of course we're not. We can't do these things unilaterally. Um, where you found yourself always in some kind of complex network of partnerships, which mostly then you know pundit writers didn't see or understand or ignore because again, kind of this image that you know everyone's just these puppets dancing on the American strings, which of course anyone who actually works in the real world knows better. So that's uh, my long answer to Mike's point is, um, yes, we do have a problem with people who live in the world of abstractions and imagery. We all understand culturally where that world has come from. And so the point, the contribution all of us can make is not so much saying we need to have a reduced or diminished view of American power, which maybe, maybe it depends. But uh, it is more is that we need to have a different definition of policy. And we need to pay attention to the, the world of policy now in which you actually can do things, not just have a posture. I want to thank you, Philip, really, for a very stimulating, useful, timely discussion. I want to take this opportunity to thank everybody who's come and who's participated um, and who, therefore, knows something about ADST.
Um, I will say that Chris Landau, who went to as ambassador to Mexico, um, downloaded our entire 3,000 page country, Mexico country reader, had his staff print it out, took it with him to Mexico. So there are a few ambassadors who um, have done this and have appreciated it. And he said it, he found it very useful. At the same time, FSI uh, was not interested in allowing us to market or advertise our country readers to the ambassadorial seminar. Yes, I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, we wanted to at, tell them all about it, you know, and so forth and so on. Now, that said, we have a problem too, um, which is the shoestring. If they all said yes, <laughs> That's a resource demand on us that we don't necessarily have. But I just put that in because you mentioned it. And I think you, uh, in response to John Bellinger's question, and I don't see John anymore, but, um, you know, what could we do more? And marketing, well, getting somebody else to realize the value and to create demand for what it is we do. And these could be practitioners and they could be scholars. We could maybe think about a way to get something going in that area, because there are people we know are big fans of it, have found it very useful. So maybe we should pay a little more attention to that side of things and figure out how we could get them to raise demand for our product. But thank you so much. It's really been an honor to have you. Um, we look forward to a continuing relationship with you and uh, being beneficiaries of your great ideas. So thank you so much. Thank you.